She works with the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., and formerly she directed uh, the Peace Economy Transition Project that was focused on building the foundations of a post-war economy. Uh, she headed a team that produced the military versus climate security reports, uh, comparing federal spending on security domains and arguing for a shift of security resources towards mitigating climate change. Her most recent work is from a militarized to a decarbonized economy, a case for conversion, which I cannot imagine, uh, given the vast amounts of money being wasted, to be blunt, on the military, uh, how that resource could be used. It also gets at one other aspect of uh, what we were talking about with the previous speaker, Dr. Iris Blum, having to do with money out there that if was available to be redirected, uh, you know, if it could save lives or if it was wasted by the military, it might be available for um, the rest of us to spend or advocate for the spending on the greening of the world or the making, meeting the basic human needs of everybody. Uh, Dr. Pemberton, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so are we gonna go forward with the slides or? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, you have, you sent me slides. I've got them uh, and I can put them up for you. Um, okay. And it was an oversight on my part. Um, let me hopefully get the screen share up to, um, let me turn that off and, um, all right. I'm gonna have to, um, They're lurking around here someplace. Um, and <laughs> I want to get the right slideshow up. Um, there we go. And and should I move the slides or are you gonna do that? Uh, I can, I will move them. Um, okay. and because actually, if we made Dr. Pemberton a co-host, she would be able to do that, correct? So we're gonna, uh, manipulate the system, the Zoom system here, so that you can um, uh, run the slideshow rather than, than me. And unless you would rather me do it, it's up to no, you. No, 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 I'm, I'm happy to do it. Okay, so let me now, um, actually that's, There we go. All yes, right. <clears throat> Shall I just jump in? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this year I, I published uh, a book called Six Stops on the National Security Tour, um, which looked at uh, the US uh, military economy. Um, and I'm hoping that that uh, provides a kind of frame for what I see as the two biggest obstacles to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. All right, so I'm moving my arrow and it's not moving. So maybe you could do that. All right, let's see if we can, um, is that, that is the next slide I hope? Uh, no. Nope. Yeah, that's the next slide I've got here. Okay, well, I need to move on, so. It's not moving for me. Uh, <laughs> Ed, I can't hear you. It's not moving. It's oh, it didn't move on your screen. All right, well then <laughs> let's figure out how to make it work. Um, and I'd also like to make it a little smaller so it's not the full screen. Oh, that's the full screen. Can you uh, take it over? And I, I wanna get out of the full screen. And um, then, doctor, I believe that if you go to the little thing that says you are viewing uh, Medyard Gable's screen, go to the view options, click on that. And so oh, um, there's a way for you to request remote control. And I think that that 
will allow you to be able to control the screen, even if Dr. Gable is sharing it. Okay. Yeah, there they are. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now, is that the right just, slide? Um, yes, yes. Um, well, no, actually not. Let's see. Can I move back? Sorry. I'm not able to, my arrows are not moving it. Okay. All right. Now we're going to see if I can do it. I can't, but I guess you can. <laughs> All right, so I guess we'll do it on the fly here. Just say next and I'll hit the next button and hope that it works. I'm gonna try it now and okay, so my down arrow is working. Okay, very good, next slide. Um, so um, this is a graph uh, produced by, <clears throat> I don't know if you've um, had them come up so far, um, it's the best a uh, resource for global military spending, uh, the Stockholm International Peace Research Bureau, um, uh, or SIPRI. And um, so <clears throat> actually the, the UN has been trying to do a global index of uh, countries' military spending, but last I checked, and I was sort of a consultant as this was being launched and, um, Last I checked, uh, they were not getting um, terribly good compliance from a lot of countries. So um, CIPRI is our best source for what's happening with global military spending. Um, and as you see, it's uh, this is this is since um, just before the end of the Cold War when there was a nice drop in military spending, um, and it's all been climbing ever since. Um, for everybody except Africa, where uh, they've had a decline in military spending uh, most recently. So thank you, Africa. Next slide. <clears throat> so here are the here are a few of the facts of global military spending uh, rose by 3.7% in real terms in 2022, um, which is the highest <clears throat> global military spending ever recorded in, in their data. So the five biggest spenders are the US, China, Russia, India, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and they control about 63% um, of global military spending <clears throat> compared to the rest of the world put together. Uh, so the US military spending uh, rose to 877 billion. Um, and that's probably not even you know, going to be stable this year. Um, uh, particularly the Republican Congress um, is, uh, you know, committed to um, adding even more um, spending on the military. You know, the pretext is the war in Ukraine, but most of this spending um, doesn't have anything to do with Ukraine. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of it is hyped to the China threat, um, but the U.S. military budget is... Um, three times what China is spending. So um, this, this um, threat from China, you know, there are obviously concerns, um, but <clears throat> compared to what the US is already spending, um, China isn't remotely uh, competitive. Uh, then we have Russia, which is uh, one tenth of what the US spends. Um, spending increased, as I mentioned, for every region, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and the Americas, only just decreasing in Africa. Next slide. Uh-oh. Admit <laughs> it's not doing anything. The next slide is not going forward. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> so this what, is... What, what, what did you do? <laughs> um, so um, this uh, depicts the, the major military spenders and uh, makes very clear that the lion's share of global military spending is coming from the United States and that China is uh, only a third of what the U.S. is spending and everybody else um, makes up, you know, another uh, quarter, third, and then there's the rest of the world. Uh, next slide. 
And then there are arms transfers. So <clears throat> that is uh, exports of weapons to other countries. And um, there again, the United States is um, by far the largest exporter. Um, it, it's, it's even more of an exporter than it is a spender on its own in terms of global proportions. Um, and uh, in this case with arms transfers, uh, Russia is, uh, is the second uh, leading uh, exporter of weapons. Uh, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> there we go. Yep. <clears throat> um, and uh, China, this, this major threat to our security, um, spends only five percent. So it's a it's a really a minor player in this enterprise of seeding the world with uh, weapons um, to wage war with. Next next slide. All right. So so here are just a few um, key facts. Um, the five largest exporters: U.S., Russia, France, China, and Germany. Um, uh, together, they supplied three quarters of the total. Uh, and again, U.S. Uh, was 40%. Um, and, you know, another important point is, uh, is that, that this is, um, that the U.S. is increasing its arms exports, 14% uh, higher than the previous five years. Um, the five largest arms importers in this period are India, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Australia, and China. And again, Africa is, um, is a very minor player. Next slide. A uh, little more nuanced uh, picture. Uh, this is all, again, data from CIPRI um, on on the on the trend line of arms exports, um, while it's been uh, growing in this century, um, there was a slight decline um, in um, in the most recent period. Um, but still, the overall trajectory is um, is increases, and and the U.S. is playing an even bigger role than than the previous five years. Next slide. Um, so then, Wait, there we go. There, okay. <clears throat> so now we get to um, the other uh, major obstacle to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and that is, of course, climate change. So um, this this is from a report by the Center for Naval Analyses, so a U.S. military. Um, uh, think tank, and um, uh, this this report um, calls climate change a threat multiplier for instability in some of the most volatile regions of the world, um, exacerbating already marginal living standards in that's a typo many Asian, African, and Middle Eastern nations, causing widespread political instability and the likelihood of failed states. Um, and what they, for some reason, don't mention here um, <clears throat> is, is the displacement of people by climate change, the, the, the refugee crisis that is um, of extraordinary um, and unprecedented levels right now. And um, unchecked climate change will simply make that uh, vector of conflict worse. Um, Finally, they say, unlike most conventional security threats, climate change has the potential to result in multiple chronic conditions occurring globally with, with, the, same con, uh, with the same time frame. Next slide. So, <laughs> um, focusing back to the US, um, and I think, uh, you know, what we've seen previously um, makes the focus on the U.S. make sense. Um, you know, the by far largest global military spender um, and arms exporter. Um, so why do we have this, um, <clears throat> what I think of as 
a, a militarized uh, industrial policy. So industrial policy um, until recently was kind of a taboo, you know, of course the US doesn't have an industrial policy. It has, um, it has the free market, which is, um, uh, you know, which is driving everything. When of course, because of this concentration of resources, uh, of US resources on the military, um, you know, that uh, just willy nilly creates a military, an over militarized um, foreign policy. Um, when clearly what we need to combat this, you know, major urgent national security threat of, of climate change, um, we need to be refocusing our attentions on uh, preventing climate catastrophe by drastically reducing emissions around the world. Um, so uh, this, so um, following the Cold War, the uh, defense contractor, military contractor uh, uh, community um, uh, implemented a, a bunch of strategies to make sure that the drastic decline that we had in, in the US military budget after the Cold War would be reversed. So uh, the US did cut its military spending after the Cold War by a third, and it um, cut the procurement budget, that is the budget that goes to private military contractors by two thirds. So <clears throat> what did the contractors do um, to try to turn this around? They were successful <laughs> as we know. Uh, one thing was, uh, you may have heard of the revolving door. So that's basically, um, here I am sitting in the Pentagon and uh, across the table from me is the, uh, you know, is the negotiator with uh, one of the major contractors. So Lockheed Martin, North, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, General Dynamics or Boeing. They, I'm sitting across this table and I know that if I, cut a very sweet deal with this contractor, um, I am more likely to get my own sweet deal when I go to work as thousands of them do uh, for one of the major weapons contractors after I leave the Pentagon. Um, and you know, this is obviously <clears throat> a, um, a real driver of uh, inflated military budgets. Then of course, you've all heard about uh, campaign contributions. So it's quite extraordinary that because we have, you know, completely gutted our campaign finance laws, um, now the, uh, the uh, major contractors funnel most of their money into the campaigns of the key players, the key committee chairman of uh, the committees in Congress that are uh, responsible for Pentagon spending. It's, <laughs> you know, it's a system of organized bribery and that's what we've got. Um, uh, but I wanted to focus and mostly in this, in the book I did, I focused mainly on um, this other strategy, which I think is probably the most important, which is <clears throat> that they decided to spread their contracts uh, even more widely um, uh, into as many states and congressional districts as they possibly could. So this is obviously not a recipe for industrial efficiency, but it is a very good recipe for um, political protection, which is, uh, you know, is, which is what they, they have achieved. So what is this crazy map here? Um, as you see, um, there are four states with stars on them, Hawaii and, and, uh, uh, and Alaska and Nebraska and, uh, and Wyoming. Those are the only four states that do not have pieces, that is contracting locations um, for the F-35 fighter jet, which is the most expensive weapons program ever conceived or executed. It's still really not, ex it, they have, they have uh, the, the uh, General Accounting Office found 
800 defects in this plane, but they have already um, started, you know, shipping these planes with all those defects overseas so that then they get another contract um, to fix the de defects all paid for by, by US uh, taxpayers. So this is the principal um, reason that it is so hard to uh, cut the US military or, or to right size it to you know, the real security threats that we face. Uh, next slide. So there's the book again. Um, uh, I decided to go around and look at some of these places and try to figure out, you know, what do they make? What uh, in the military economy? Um, who works there? Um, and how does what they make there fit into the larger whole of the U.S. military uh, uh, enterprise? So, for example, I went to uh, Los Alamos, where. Uh, the nuclear age was born and is being perpetuated. Um, <clears throat> I went to this uh, air base uh, north in the mountains over, um, over, over the mountains north of LA. Um, and here is an air base where three of the major contractors, it's the only place in the country where three of the major contractors, uh, Lockheed, Northrop, and Boeing, um, all coexist on this same air base. And on one end of the base, um, Northrop is building this new mega uh, nuclear bomber. And on the other end, uh, Lockheed is among other things, working on putting hypersonic weapons onto existing uh, 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 fighter jets, including, um, including the F-35. I also went to um, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, um, which is where <clears throat> during World War II, the US uh, developed its uh, stockpiles of chemical weapons. Um, and this is a very destitute corner of uh, Southeastern Arkansas. Um, and uh, so this, this military base has become, you know, kind of the economic mainstay of this otherwise um, destitute community. But uh, then the world, to its credit, um, uh, signed and ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention, outlawing, uh, outlawing all uh, chemical weapons stockpiles. And so suddenly their mission became not stockpiling these weapons, but uh, just uh, getting rid of them. Um, which they did. Uh, one guy I talked to at the base talked about um, climbing on top of um, this vat that had held this nerve agent um, with, and he was he was climbing up there with a Soviet uh, at that point Soviet um, uh, uh, official whose job it was to make sure that these that these um, that this, you know, this uh, vat of nerve agent was in fact empty. So um, their mission, uh, the mission at this base uh, became obsolete. And so then the question became, you know, what do we do now, now that this, now that this is gone and now that the world has um, gotten rid of this highly dangerous um, Mostly, <laughs> mostly gotten rid of the this highly uh, dangerous uh, weapon of mass destruction. Uh, next slide. So one question uh, is, you know, is it possible to uh, fulfill the biblical injunction of converting swords into plowshares and uh, spears into pruning hooks? Um, that is, can you actually take military uh, technology and turn turn them toward um, other purposes? And for my money, the most important purpose is um, developing uh, emissions reducing technology. So <clears throat> after quite a search, I found one perfectly good example um, that this is possible. So here is an engineer, he worked for Lockheed and then Lockheed sold it to another major contractor, BAE Systems. 
Um, his name was Bob Devine. And, you know, at the end of the Cold War, um, so BAE was making all these fighter jets <clears throat> and the en its engineers were assigned because contracts for military weapons were imploding um, and the company was getting very nervous. And so they, they told their engineers, figure out what else we might be able to do. And so these engineers figured out how to take the hydraulic system from a fighter jet they were working on. And then <clears throat> they figured out regenerative braking from this locomotive project. And they um, put it into a hybrid electric bus. And now they are working on, now they, they have an, elect, an all electric bus, they have hydrogen fuel cell run buses. Um, <clears throat> and those buses are operating on the streets of New York London, Tokyo, um, and many, many other uh, places in the world. They just got another contract for a thousand of those buses in, um, in for Quebec City. So it is perfectly possible um, to take some military technology and turn it to the purposes of a green technology transition. But um, this example was really hard to find, and <clears throat> that's because, uh, you know, at the end of uh, the last century, military spending, for reasons I've just talked about, um, began to balloon. Uh, then comes 9-11, and, you know, all bets are off. All controls are, are gone, really. Um, and so um, military contractors <laughs> lost pretty much lost interest in, in doing this. Um, and uh, this sort of transition is gonna remain mar marginalized without um, a real shift to a green industrial policy. That is the combination of regulations and um, technology support and develop and incentives and investment um, to sh to move the move the economy toward producing what the world desperately needs um, to prevent climate catastrophe. Next slide. Um, so, are there any good models um, for a green industrial policy? Um, in fact, there is one uh, that I talk about in the book. It's called. It, it is. Um, it is uh, California after the post after the Cold War ended. So um, you may have heard of the epic smog problem that Southern California had. Um, and they also um, they were the, the, the site of uh, much of the aerospace industry of the of the US and its military. Um, and as I mentioned, you know that uh, that industry collapsed. And um, so Southern California was really hurting and you know, layoffs were, were massive. Um, so uh, they had already begun to address their smog problem um, by setting the strictest, strictest emission standards in the nation. Um, and uh, oddly, uh, Ronald Reagan created something called the California Air Resources Board, which was supposed to enforce standards, but they did it in a very creative way and a collaborative way, um, uh, bringing together the utilities and the public and the business sector and local governments to all collaborate on getting this done. And in 1990, the state legislature uh, required manufacturers to produce an increasing number of zero emission vehicles. Next slide. Um, so, in 1992, um, end of the Cold War, uh, the Los Angeles Board of Supervisors commissioned an economic modeling outfit to, decide, to devise a strategy um, to deal with the implosion of the local in aerospace industry. So, they came up with this whole plan to combine uh, public goals on mass transportation, environmental quality, alternative energy vehicles and job creation for high technology workers. 
Next slide. Next slide. Mm-hmm. Oop, wait. There we go. Um, so uh, the this all this coordination to uh, create a real in regional industrial policy was called Project California. And uh, the intent was to look at what are the competitive advantages um, from aerospace that can be used for these other purposes. Um, so systems integration, so-called, um, is one that's, uh, you know, the military contractors make big projects and they're very complicated. And so that they're good at integrating a lot of different systems and making them all work. They're somewhat good at it <laughs> anyway. They should be good at it. Um, another uh, another competitive advantage uh, they, def they identified was remote imaging and sensing, also satellite communications and composite materials, the materials that are kind of lightweight, you know, for, for aircraft and uh, can be useful for other, other forms of transportation. Next slide. So um, they looked in particular at um, transferring these competencies um, and building up uh, a, an industry to take the place of an imploded aerospace industry in um, mass transit. Uh, telecommunications, electric vehicles, fuel cell power, and high-speed rail. These were their points of focus. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> industrial transitions of this magnitude and scale are uh, really hard. <laughs> and so um, they knew that they needed to put in programs to kind of help make this transition and you know get over the hump for this new um, industrial development. So you know one problem is uh, research and development funds, which uh, if you're a Pentagon contractor, the Pentagon in most cases pays. Um, and if you're developing a, a green technology, um, those things uh, R and D for those uh, projects is mostly not not paid by another entity. So they realized they had to um, amass some uh, <clears throat> R&D funds to help, help move these technologies forward. And then um, uh, they also knew that they, that, uh, you know, the, to develop these technologies, they needed uh, incubators, prototype testing facilities, um, help getting, uh, federal assistance and also restructuring the management. Um, if you've got, uh, if you're a Pentagon contractor, you have one client, <laughs> um, and if you if you've got to figure out how to sell to multiple clients, as for example, um, those makers of those buses did, um, you need you need to um, do some restructuring of of management to make that possible. And then, and then they also focused on um, changing the the uh, state job training uh, system so that uh, it was really targeted to the needs of all of these uh, laid off defense workers that might um, get a piece of this um, new new industry and might get a job. Uh, next slide. So um, the most uh, the most concrete uh, effort to kind of pull all this together um, and get this uh, get these new markets going um, by combining standard setting and regulation, um, public procurement to underwrite these these markets, and public R and D funds was um, a project they started uh, called CalStart. Next slide. Um, and <clears throat> here they brought together, you know, a whole range of the relevant players. So um, they brought together um, military contractors, commercial uh, manufacturers, engineering and environmental research firms, public utilities, the Air Resources Board, labor leaders, 
and state and local officials. And the whole idea was to bring all these people together and say, okay, how are we going to do this and who's gonna do what? Next slide. So um, they started in 1992, they had 40 institutional members, quickly doubled that number. And now CalSTART is, is still operating um, uh, and it has 210 institutional member, members, including defense contractors, uh, uh, commercial manufacturers and the utilities and all of those other ones I mentioned. Um, so they started out uh, with three uh, initial projects. Uh, so charging station infrastructure, a prototype electric car and electric buses. Next slide. Uh, now for the problems. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if you're a Pentagon pro a contractor, you have all your R you often have all your R and D costs covered, not the case in these new markets. Um, then if you're a military uh, contractor, you have cost plus contracts that are also common. Um, this was developed when they were first trying to um, lure commercial manufacturers to produce uh, the weapons uh, to win World War II. You know, so General Motors had to make tanks. How did they, um, you know, beyond patriotism, what did they do? Uh, to uh, entice General Motors to get to get into this. Um, they said, we will pay you whatever your costs are with a guaranteed profit on top. And th that structure doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, but the military, um, uh, you know, still uh, pertains to a good portion of military contracts. So that's an advantage that um, kind of deters people from from uh, moving into other industrial areas. Um, and they often have multi-year co uh, contracts, which is also pretty unusual um, for uh, you know, industrial production. Next slide. Um, also, um, there wasn't enough federal support. So uh, when Bill Clinton uh, clinched the nomination uh, for president from the Democrat, Democratic Party, um, he promised, he made many promises, of course, uh, and one of them was that we were going to convert our economy from a defense giant to a domestic giant. He really said that. And, um, you know, the defense budget did come down, um, and they did have a pretty wide ranging uh, program for converting. Uh, military technology to civilian use. But um, oh, in the four year period that they were doing this, they had um, they spent about 16, a total on all the different pieces of about $16 billion. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that was supposed to compensate for uh, cuts that cumulatively amounted to about $118 dollars. So <clears throat> that amount just wasn't sufficient for what economists like to call demand pull. So it wasn't enough to get over these humps and create on the civilian side of, um, uh, of the economy, um, you know, enough to, to create new markets for these contractors to move into and um, for you know, for the economy to shift um, in a in a non-military direction. Also, um, the defense contractors paid a lot of lip service to being, you know, interested in doing this, but um, uh, kind of behind closed doors, um, they were really hoping to kind of hunker down and wait for the defense and work on getting that defense budget back up again. Which, as I said. They did. Uh, the car makers were really not that interested in creating an electric vehicle uh, industry in Southern California, most of them, um, and neither was uh, neither was the public. Now, of course, the car makers are very interested in in this, and the public is very interested in this. And we just have to hope that um, since they didn't do it back then, 
you know, it, it isn't too late for us to do it now. Next slide. CalSTART um, sort of lost its focus on converting military technology when the defense budget started to, to rise again, um, but they have uh, persevered and they've expanded their purview beyond California um, to other places in the country and also it, they work internationally um, and they, they've gone beyond electric vehicles um, to work on standard setting and uh, investment in the electrification of trucks um, and uh, maritime vehicles and a whole range of other, other forms of transportation that all need to go electric really fast. Um, and parenthetically, that the manager of uh, BAE's electric bus program I talked about um, is on the CalSTART board. Next slide. So um, on a national level, what do we have? Um, well, what we don't have is what California have, which is um, a, an imploding uh, military budget. We have the opposite right now. However, um, we do have um, the, the best uh, green uh, industrial policy framework we've ever had in the form of the spending primarily in the Inflation Reduction Act um, that, that is looking at a range of, uh, to incentivize, to promote, to, um, uh, you know, to invest in uh, a range of, uh, of uh, climate technologies, electric vehicles, um, you know, the grid, you, you know, all of the, uh, the solar, the wind, the, um, all of the pieces of a, um, of a uh, industrial framework to um, drastically reduce our emissions. Um, uh, also, you know, working on public procurement, that is, you know, that government buys electric vehicles and provides that kind of guaranteed market that um, you really need to, to get into a new um, form of production. Next slide. Um, but as I say, <laughs> what we don't have is um, a uh, shrunken military budget, you know, pushing this along. Um, so <clears throat> this is uh, looking at the pie for um, the discretionary budget for 2023, the discretionary budget being um, what Congress votes on every year, not including um, Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, uh, but as you see, um, more than half of our uh, federal resources that Congress votes on um, is now going to the military. Next slide. Um, and, you know, here we have the United States over there on the right. And, uh, you know, the next nine countries combined, which don't spend that much. Um, uh, and actually, um, this uh, graph is slightly out of date uh, with the increased spending that we've had and are going to have. Um, uh, the US is now spending more than the next 10 countries put together. Uh, next slide. So if you look at uh, US military spending versus what we are putting into um, the Inflation Reduction Act um, to uh, green our economy. Uh, the, the greening of the economy industrial policy is getting about 4% of what uh, the Pentagon is getting. Next slide. So the bottom line, unless the world, particularly the developed world, spends less on its military forces and more on preventing climate change, um, the UN Sustainable De Development Goals will remain out of reach. So, um, so we can talk about, uh, you know, a few things that are kind of promising signs along these lines, but um, I, I think it's time to um, 
uh, to hear from you all what your questions are. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Let's make sure I'm on. Uh, thank you for this very informative presentation, uh, Dr. Pemberton. This is um, interesting from my perspective for a variety of reasons, one of which is the details on the California plan uh, tells us the level of complexity dealing with a highly developed country like the United States. Other work that we've done in the past, last year groups were working on the electrification of villages in Africa, for example. How would you uh, get electricity to a village and then scale that to thousands of villages so that the five to 600 million people in Africa without electricity can uh, get electricity? And there, the level of complexity to pull off that uh, might have the same pieces that you presented that the California folks did, the collaboration between different sectors and the like, but it doesn't seem like it's hopefully quite as complicated um, or the, the stakes, there aren't as many vested interests. There's not the established humongous military industrial complex there, I hope. I mean, that might be a naive assessment on my part, but thank you for all of what you had to say. Um, I would like to open it up to questions for everybody in the room, both you know here in Philadelphia, Truxley University, as well as online. So uh, I'd like I'm, to I'm, see- Sorry, I'm so sorry. Questions. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna have to plug in the, my computer. So you're gonna have to- and Edmund, can you get rid of the slides? Just hit stop slide share. Okay. No, I'm all right. So do we have questions? Those of you who have got um, access to your chat, let's um, see what questions she can answer when she gets back. Um, Okay, so uh, Carly's got a question, Amon's got a question. Uh, the rest of you can think of questions. Uh, where did she say she had to go to? Computer. What? To plug her computer. I can't hear you, Edmund. She what? To plug her computer. To plug, to plug her computer. Oh, it's like she lost electricity or something? I guess her battery's down. Oh, okay. I should probably check mine, um, but I'm okay. All right, well, when she gets back, we'll start asking her questions, uh, starting with Carly's uh, question. All right, sorry, very Welcome sorry. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're, okay, so you're there, and I'm gonna uh, read you the first question we had. Um, let's see, um, I've had, all right, so, you know, here it is. Do you think there are ways to convince the U.S. to decrease its spending on militarization? If so, what will it take? Yeah, that's a great question. That is uh, the question that, you know, networks I work with <laughs> are thinking about all the time. Um, you know, we are in a very tough spot um, with, <clears throat> you know, maybe a, a resurgence of the of the Cold War and and uh, you know the Ukraine invasion has become um, the pretext for uh, you know just throwing money at the Pentagon, most of which doesn't even have to do with uh, Ukraine. Um, you know that's that's a really uh, a, a real tough one. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of research and advocacy going on about uh, pushing back on this on this China threat, uh, which is being inflated, um, you know, for purposes that that I've talked about. Uh, um, you know, it's really good. Uh, the China threat is really good for the contractors. Um, uh, <clears throat> So, you know, the war on terror, a lot of money was spent on the so-called war on terror, um, uh, but um, it wasn't uh, the kind of production that 
the contractors really wanted to do, not the big bucks uh, contract contracts for these mega uh, weapons platforms. It was, um, <clears throat> you know, at, at some points they were trying to use the F-35 to show its, its that fighter jet I talked about, um, to show its utility um, to, uh, you know, to the war on terror, you know, which was ridiculous because none of the uh, adversaries <laughs> had any fighter jets, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, what they really want is a return to the Cold War, uh, you know, major superpowers uh, in an arms race with each other. That's what they really want. And that's what they're trying to get by inflating um, the China threat. And so I think pushing back on that whole narrative is um, extremely important. Um, I'd point you to uh, a fairly new think tank called the Quincy Institute, which um, is, is doing a lot to push back on that, on that narrative. Um, and unless we do, uh, you know, we're gonna have uh, increased militarization. I don't know how, how it's gonna be stopped. In terms of the green transition, um, you know, we, we have um, this, you know, major pot of money that's going to be there and is not really capped. They talk about 370 billion, um, um, but over 10 years, but it's, some of it is not really capped. So um, it can be a lot more money than that. So, you know, I'm trying to kind of get the word out about, about, you know, how to access those funds. Um, um, but another, I mean, I guess one, one interesting possible uh, bipartisan development, which was kind of surprising to me, um, uh, that, that has potential to um, create a lot more money for a green transition um, is this idea of a financial transactions tax that has been around for you know, a long time, uh, which is just, you know, a tiny little amount added to um, every, every financial transaction that is, you know, uh, uh, you know, hedge fund managers <laughs> um, uh, churning money, uh, which makes money for them and doesn't really do anything for, you know, the productivity of the economy as a whole. Um, and so, uh, this is this idea has been kicked around um, for a long time, um, but um, I'm now hearing that uh, there is some there there are some uh, Congress people from both sides of the aisle that are working together to revive this idea, um, and that would be a huge infusion of funds. I, I guess they don't want to just tax the rich directly in corporations, but this is a way to, um, you know, tax this unproductive churning of money um, that could pre could create um, a lot of a lot of money um, that could be put into a green transition. There's also, I guess, I'd say finally. Um, uh, quite a bit of interest in um, closing down some of uh, the military bases, particularly the overseas bases. Uh, the Pentagon itself does um, says it has about 30% excess capacity, meaning bases that are not being used, um, but are just sort of kept alive because of the economy, as in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, that example I mentioned, um, the, the, the local economy has come to depend on um, the base. And so, um, so the Pentagon wants to shut down, you know, a lot of them and save money. Um, and then there are the overseas bases. Um, you know, the question of, do we really want to be the world's uh, policemen? Do we really want to, do we really think our security is, um, it, it's necessary to have 750 military industri 
uh, installations on every continent of the world. No other country uh, is even remotely trying to do something like that. Uh, certainly not China. So, so um, you know, there's a clear case to be made, and there are advocates and researchers who are who are making this case, and there are some members of Congress who are um, quite interested, particularly in closing down some of our overseas bases um, that uh, you know create as many threats as they might uh, as they might deter. You know, as we as we know, uh, 9/11, um, uh, Osama bin Laden was was you know, mainly motivated by these U.S. military bases in Saudi Arabia. Um, so, um, you know, there's some movement on, on that issue, which would, um, which would be helpful. Um, and, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of people um, making the case that um, having, you know, spending more money uh, than the next 10 countries put together and, you know, arguing that we need even more money uh, than that on top um, is kind of madness. And um, we just have to keep kind of pushing that case. Thank you. There's a couple more questions. Uh, one of which is, um, is the issue of overspending by the military purely political? Considering that it may be influenced by foreign relations to some extent, does this make it a problem that is increasingly difficult for those not heavily involved in politics to help solve? Um, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, what the focus of that question is. I, I'm not entirely um, clear what they're getting at. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Is well, it entirely political as opposed to what, I guess? Who knows? Um, the, the answer will have to come via the text. Uh, so we'll move on to another question that's a change of subject slightly. And um, it may push the boundaries of your research, but um, it says, bearing in mind how most African countries have no access to electricity in most parts of the country, do you think it's possible to have things like electric buses in those parts now or, is, or in the near future? And uh, is there a plan that you know of that, uh, that has been put into place to make this happen? Um. You know that's that's an excellent question. Um, uh, I I would say you know the electric buses that I have focused on <laughs> from this one contractor. Um, it's a it's a very good point that that most of them are going to the global north. That's that's you know mostly the market. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know an electric bus doesn't require really well it, it does require an electric grid for for charging but but i mean there are it, you know i this this you're right this is beyond the, the scope of what i actually know about but just thinking it through um uh this is not like an electric car that has to be recharged uh you know every day or so um these are batteries that um, have a longer life, um, but uh, you know that would be a hugely important um, uh, project to work on um, to figure out uh, a system that allows that would allow for electric buses in uh, countries where they just don't have much of an electrical grid. It's a, it's a it's um, a great question and a great uh, problem to work on, yeah. So here's a, one more question, uh, more in line with the work you did, the study of the California system, but it goes beyond that. It says, after California, what have been the most uh, successful examples of states or nations taking the economic uh, conversion uh, in 
for for uh, civilian use? That too, <laughs> they're all great questions. Um, you know, I would say in general, the overall trajectory has been, you know, you saw in those graphs, um, global military spending and in particular US military spending um, climbing in this century with, you know, a few dips, but mostly headed, headed upwards. Um, so um, I'd say that uh, there, that probably the best examples of um, of conversion have have to do with um, the bases that uh, you know there hasn't been a base realignment and closure commission that is the is the the um, uh, the mechanism set up by Congress to actually take base closure decisions out of the realm of politics. Maybe this gets to um, that that uh, earlier question that I failed to uh, answer. Um, but um, even though there haven't been very many of these processes uh, lately, um, the, you know, taking a base that is closed down and um, and converting it and, and sort of giving it back to the community and letting the community um, you know, use what's there um, to further their their own local economic development. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, a lot of examples of um, base closure redevelopment that have been very successful. So, for example, uh, the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard um, closed as a as a a navy operation. Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, and it took a while and a lot of money, but now um, on in that area that was the naval shipyard, um, there are more people employed than there ever were when the thing was a base. So it's a mixture of retail and uh, light manufacturing and um, some housing and, um, you know, a whole interesting mix of um, of uh, enterprises that are that are uh, you know doing more for the community of Philadelphia than than the naval shipyard ever did. Um, there's an, another nice example um, uh, in in uh, Brunswick, Maine, uh, base closure um, that has uh, created a real vibrant uh, economic. Um, you know, set of enterprises for the city of Brunswick. So the examples are mainly concentrated on uh, in urban areas. It's a lot easier to bring in different assets to build up a, um, uh, a you know, a, a base to become um, a, you know, key feature of the, of the, of the domestic local economy. Um, uh, it's so it's mainly in the urban areas where this has been successful and uh, a lot of the bases are out there in the hinterlands where you want, if you want nuclear silos, which I do not, you can, you can get rid of those completely, but um, they're there and they are, there's really nothing else out there. Um, so when they close, um, you know, it's really hard to, to recreate those jobs. But I'd say, in a climate of 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 um, uh, increased increasing military spending, um, the base closure process is probably um, the best place to look for success at the moment. So one more question, if you've got the time, there's a clarification on that one that you wanted some more information on. Oh, great. Uh, and the the. Uh, the clarification is the, the 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 question was more about whether new proposals to solve overspending can overcome any of the apparent foreign threats that might appear to justify it. It's basically, how can we win the battle, the public relations battle, or the one with Congress and the spending of the money? It's really fundamental to shifting the tide of going from military 
800, 900 billion dollars spent on the military in the US, whatever your number was, 2.4 in the world trillion. Um, how can we shift the tide to getting that money into converting over to a, you know, a, a world where everybody's needs are met and the climate is regenerating? Uh, yeah, I say, yeah, I'd say the questioner is, is uh, you know, is really right that, um, that uh, a, you know, an argument on the basis of foreign policy is just going to be uh, necessary in this very difficult climate that we have. And um, I guess I would just uh, refer again to um, the Quincy Institute's uh, reports, and there, there are many others from the Council on Foreign Relations and the Carnegie Endowment, and, you know, looking at um, the, the China threat, which is the main pretext for, um, you know, building back up a Cold War style uh, military. Um, and of course, we're, we're spending more now on the military uh, than we were at any point in the Cold War. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's in adjusting for inflation. So, um, uh, you know, the, the case for lower military spending will have to be um, you know, a, a key component of uh, making that case has to be on foreign policy grounds that we are uh, we are inflating um, threats that are getting in the way of in you know absolutely essential investments in um, you know the greatest security threat of our time, namely uh, climate change. All right, well, I need to, um, we've trespassing on your time here. We're five minutes over, and I'd like to thank you for your presentation, for being here, for going a little bit extra answering these questions. Uh, we really appreciate it, and thank you for giving us this, not just on military expenditures and the outrageous uh, amounts being spent, but also how at least one good example of how California started to make a transition, at least in some aspects, to a greener, healthier uh, economy. So thank you for all that you put into this, and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we will, we need to move on. Uh, we were waiting for our next speakers from the UN. And um, I don't know if they got lost on the way, but I just communicated with them last night. So I know they're, they're coming, but thank you. I don't want to, you know, keep you any longer. We've, we've kept you, you know, it's six after whatever, uh, 11. And uh, I'm confident you've got other things on your agenda besides talking to us folks. So <laughs> thank you. Well, well, my pleasure. And, um, I'll be sorry to miss uh, hearing about what you all come up with. Uh, and it would have been great to sort of make some suggestions about those proposals, but I'm not gonna be able to do that, but maybe next year. Anyway, thank you so much. All right, thank Take you. Take care you all. Bye-bye.